thank you for uh, your interest. Yes, my my passion is um, discussing social determinants of health mm -hmm. um, and getting people to understand um, their role in their communities, mm -hmm. um, as well as the role of their leaders, such as yourself, mm -hmm. um, and optimizing how do we get resources and how do we communicate effectively um, to our leaders um, to get the best health and not just look at the healthcare environment um, in terms of health. So coming in, um, I don't know that much about the Bronx. Let me just give you an overview then. Sure. So um, we are a borough of 1.4 million, 1.4 million plus. We're headed towards 1.5 million. Um, it's, we're, in terms of population, we're comparable to the city of Philadelphia. Okay. Uh, we are a borough where uh, more than about 40% of the people who live here were born in another country. Um, the majority of the people who live here are Latino and women. So we have a 53% Latino population. Uh, we have about a 56% female population in our borough. Um, we, about 37, 38% of the people who live here were not born or did not live here 25 years ago. So when you look at the negative stereotypes, when you look at the 70s, the 80s, and the early 90s, you know, the Bronx is completely different. It's not what people still think it, it is or used to be. And the population, for the most part, is different. And our population, when you look at um, those who are here, uh, they're from West Africa. They're from parts of Europe. Um, we have a lot of uh, growing Albanian population. We have a, a, a robust Bangladeshi population. Um, and of course, while the Latinos once upon a time were Puerto Ricans for the most part, uh, we have the largest Dominican population outside of the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. in the Bronx. It used to be Washington Heights, but in the 2010 uh, census, uh, many of the Dominicans have either come here or moved from Washington Heights particularly to, through the Western Corridor of the Bronx, but we also have about 110 to 125,000 Mexicans. Um, there's a population called the Garifuna population uh, who uh, come from Honduras, Guatemala, Belize, uh, interesting history. Uh, many people thought that they were African Americans, but if you look at their history, they, they were uh, basically um, people who were a population that were brought from from um, Africa many many years ago to this side of the world and they were never enslaved and um, for many years while you had the whole slavery trade in in, um, in the United States they were in those countries um, living freely uh, because of shipwrecks or what ha or what have you um, we did not get to know um, as New Yorkers who many of them came here many years ago, but they assimilated. And we did not know who they were um, as Garifunas until there was a huge tragedy. Uh, it was, uh, I think, 1987. Um, I think so. 1987 was the Happy Land fire. Uh, and the Happy Land fire uh, happened because uh, there was a club where they get to, um, there's a, they have their music called Punta and their dance. And uh, they would go there and celebrate in festivities and somebody set fire, a jealous boyfriend set fire to the place. And we lost many, um, we lost more than 80 lives there. And that's, that's how the Garifuna community started coming together and the whole world um, got to see that they were not African Americans, um, but they were this, this beautiful culture, multilingual, called Garifuna. Uh, the Bronx, has experienced a, a renaissance in the last eight and a half years alone. Since I've been here, we've seen over 30,000 plus units of housing built. We have seen over 13 billion private dollars invested in our borough in the last eight and a half years alone. We've seen an unemployment rate go from 14.1% to just under six. Um, about 100, that, uh, 110,000 more Bronxites are working today than the day that I took office, the first day that I took office. Uh, we went from, I mean, last year uh, the crime rate was the lowest since the early 1950s in our borough. Um, 
yeah, it, it was just a phenomenal year, 2017. Uh, it was our, actually our fifth straight year of under 100 homicides. Um, but we were down to 72. I don't know how you really celebrate that because one death is one too many. But if you compare, if you do the, the um, if you use the metric system, the national metric system of one homicide per every 100,000 residents, what a lot of people who are going to be watching or watching this podcast or uh, and throughout the United States or even in the world don't know is that when you compare us, we're safer than Philly. We're safer than, than, um, than Baltimore. We're safer than Dallas, Houston, uh, Boston, uh, DC. We, we, we're not even, you don't even have to compare us to Chicago or Detroit. That was what we used to be 30, 40 years ago. And, and so because of that, we've seen an increase in our tourism. We've seen all of this development. We've seen this job creation. And I, and I give you that overview because um, I think that there's been a tremendous body of work done by the elected officials, both present and those past, uh, community leaders, community activists and advocates, uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, and, and you know, it, it, it feels good. And there's a lot to brag about, I, I, if I can use that word. But to your point, and the reason why we're here, the one area I cannot brag about is health. And when you have all of this development, when you have all of this economic boom, uh, you know, a lot of the, the words like displacement and gentrification come into play, and it weighs heavy on me every single day. It's the reason why we continue with low income housing, is the reason why we also uh, create jobs and we fought for the increase in minimum wage and, and, um, and living wage. That whole living wage law in the city of New York started from a fight that we had here. Uh, eight years ago at the Kingsbridge Armory. Um, so all of that weighs on me, but I'm really concerned, just to get in now into your conversation, I'm really concerned about whether or not we're gonna have a healthy citizenry uh, to be able to benefit from all of the progress that you've seen in our borough. So that's a good place to start. For those who may not know who you are, introduce yourself um, and your role um, in terms of leadership in the Bronx. So I am a born and raised, uh, I'm a lifelong Bronxite. Uh, my parents are from Puerto Rico. I was, uh, got involved in politics at a very young age. At the time, in 1996, I was elected to be the youngest state assembly member. And uh, over the last eight and a half years, I've been the Bronx borough president. So in the city of New York, you have the mayor, obviously you have congressional members, you have state senators, you have assembly members, which I used to serve. You have city council members, but, but um, each one of the five boroughs has its own borough president. Um, and we're the only ones who have to take into consideration the entire borough with all of the complexities and all of its diversities uh, and whenever decisions are being made. And um, the city charter gives us a number of, of, um, of duties and responsibilities, namely around land use and, and how you develop land here. Uh, you have appointments to the community boards, you have appointments to different agencies like the pension, um, the, the New York City pension system, NICERS. Uh, you have uh, the franchising board here in the city of New York. We have a say so in that. So if somebody like a cable uh, station or, or cable company wants to come into the Bronx, they cannot do that with our, uh, with our, our consent and our vote. Um, uh, we have uh, appointments to the, uh, the, the, the panel on education, the education panel. Uh, but also we work with all the different levels of government uh, to create housing, to create jobs, uh, to do the best that we can to protect the environment, to work to make you know, crime uh, go down. Uh, and as the borough president, I think that we've done a good job and we've turned the ship around in many of those areas, including health. So um, in the state of New York, there are 62 counties, and we are unfortunately the unhealthiest county of the 62 counties. And so we've tried to do a number of things to combat um, uh, and, to, and to inform and to work with the community and work with with healthcare institutions. I mean, we, we have some of the best healthcare institutions in the world here in the Bronx. And uh, one out of every four adult 
that has a job in the Bronx is employed by the healthcare industry. So it's mind boggling to me as to why if one out of every adult is in contact in one way, shape or form, either being a custodian or a doctor um, at our hospitals, if they're in contact with sick people on a daily basis, why is it that we're not taking that information home and why is it that we're still the sickest county? So my curiosity is your job is very complex. Mm -hmm. You spoke extensively <laughs> on the diversity of your borough. Um, and so I'm sure that makes uh, health outcomes uh, a difficult task, especially when we're speaking about improving them. Um, so what are some specific um, strategies or initiatives that you've um, worked towards in terms of um, improving health outcomes uh, in the Bronx? Well, one of the things that we've done over the last couple of years is we started a, a, a social media campaign. It's called Hashtag Not 62. Just to bring you back to what I was saying earlier about us being a 60, number, number 62. 62. Yeah. So that's not a good number, right? It means that we're last. And um, we know that everyone, even my mom is on social media, right? So how is it that we use social media, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, how is it that we use that as a tool so that Bronxites can encourage each other and teach each, each other? So for instance, so you, go, so you go to the gym and if you have a new exercise that you've been doing or um, you're using a particular machine, we, we encourage people to take photos, we encourage people to take videos and put it on hashtag now 62 so that if somebody else is going to a gym or is a new member and they may not know how to use a machine or they may not know how to, um, you know, you have um, uh, the, the, the right form so that you do an exercise, we, we teach each other that way. Uh, we encourage people to post um, recipes, healthy recipes, uh, just little things. For instance, um, I always use this one. My wife and I, we love tuna fish salads. Um, and so instead of using mayonnaise, we use uh, 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 plain yogurt oh. to cut down on the fat from the mayonnaise. Uh, we just last week she made, um, um, you know, instead of making spaghettis uh, with um, with spinach and and chicken, uh, she takes uh, zucchini, and and you know, so we have like a, I don't even know what to call it, but <laughs> it's what is it called? Zudos. Zudos. So instead of having that pasta. Yeah. You have uh, you know a string of zucchini with, with with your chicken and your and your spinach and and if you add a little sauce if you don't want to do it with spinach if you add some sauce some tomato so sauce it tastes just like um, spaghetti so these are things that we post I do that myself I'm hungry <laughs> <laughs> so these are things these are things that Hilda and I we always we we we're, we're gym rats yeah. right and. We're always posting our exercise routines or what have you. And, and thousands of Bronx have done that. So that's one of the specifics. The other thing is um, we know that unfortunately, and we've been working on this with all the development, we encourage developers to have um, uh, uh, a space or to try to get tenants for that have healthy foods, um, supermarkets, but we still have food deserts. So a number of years ago when uh, Fresh Direct, which is the online grocer, was thinking of leaving um, the city of New York and they were being wooed by New Jersey. We said, why don't you come to the Bronx? But at that time, we found something out that they did not deliver to the entire borough. Uh, they only delivered to Riverdale, which is the Northwest Bronx. And so we, in, in our negotiations, we were able to negotiate that they would deliver to the entire Bronx. Then, the, then from there we had further conversations of, well, you know, how do we do so in a way where those who have um, EBT cards, uh, who are in public assistance, can order online? And then we found something out. We found that the federal government did not allow for EBT cardholders to order anything online. And so we don't want people to order sneakers or, or alcohol online with their EBT card naturally. But we, we, we didn't know why um, healthy foods, fresh vegetables, um, um, fresh fruits were not allowed. And so we got into conversations with um, the federal government. We were able to have a small pilot program 
um, here with three zip codes. It worked well. Fresh Direct waived their delivery fees for EBT cardholders. And, and we saw that uh, parents who had kids with allergies or whatever were you know, able now uh, to order online Fresh Direct and have it delivered, and you know when they needed, you know, uh, certain foods uh, to their doorstep. Senior citizens, people who had disabilities, uh, or people who simply just had to walk too far, or pay for they didn't have a car, they had to pay taxi, cab fare, or haul, um, you know, their groceries on you know public transportation. We were able to have them be able to order uh, online and have their foods delivered right to their doorsteps. The, um, that worked out so well that then we worked with the um, New York State, the entire uh, congressional delegation, and they went back to D.C. and they were able to get the Department of Agriculture to do a, a national uh, pilot program which will be launched um, later this year in the summertime, correct, Paula? Yes. So the pilot program now consists of six, six states, New York being one of them. So something that started in the Bronx, something that started with just three zip codes, now is all over the state of New York, or will be all over the state of New York. And it's not just uh, Fresh Direct, but Amazon and a couple of other online grocers upstate New York uh, will be able to deliver uh, to EBT card holders. Uh, we have a, a, another program where um, uh, we work with senior citizen centers and providers, namely the Mary Mitchell Center, uh, uh, where our seniors now, they pay either with their EBT or, or, or cash, $8, and I've done this myself personally, like I've delivered them, and you deliver healthy produce, uh, vegetables, fruits, um, uh, to the seniors in, at the senior centers. So that they go to their senior center, you coordinate with the senior citizens, and it continues to expand. Um, during the, the warmer months, we, we purchase um, a lot of this produce from our farmer's markets. So we've increased the amount of farmer's markets that come into the Bronx now, from upstate New York particularly. We've increased the amount of EBT card holders that are going and purchased. I think that we're number one in the city of EBT card holders because of the promotions that we've given it to go into the farmer's markets. And then we purchase the, um, this, uh, these products uh, and then we deliver, Mary Mitchell, we deliver them to the senior centers. So that from there, they just go right with their bags. And it's only eight bucks, but they get a good bang for the buck. Uh, and in the winter times, then we do that with the um, Hunt Point Produce Market, which is the largest m market in, in, um, in certainly the Western Hemisphere, if not the world. Um, We've, uh, we've done everything from uh, making sure that our, our youth are trained uh, around HIV prevention uh, and are trained on how to give that training back. So not only are they getting the information of how to, to prevent from getting HIV and AIDS uh, so that we can be, we, we're trying to be the number one contributor to um, ending the epidemic in 2020, we are part we're very much a part of the, uh, Governor Cuomo's initiative of ending the epidemic by 2020, uh, which means that you would have less than 2,000 um, diagnoses a year. And uh, certainly they were trending in the right direction here in the Bronx. Uh, and that's because we have a robust uh, network of, of um, community providers working with um, our office, Paul Richter is our director of, of health. Uh, working with uh, nonprofits and uh, many of our healthcare providers and our youth uh, going into schools, training them first so they know how to take care of themselves, but then they can go back and take that information to their peers. Yeah. Um, because we know that unfortunately many of our, um, when you saw HIV and AIDS, it was, it, you know, the, 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 um, the numbers are going up in our, among our youth. We are doing a lot around opioids um, and making sure that we have fewer and fewer uh, overdoses. And we do that by um, having naloxone available to uh, not only nonprofits, but I mean, we've been working with uh, taxi drivers and livery car drivers and, and owners of sto uh, corner store bodegas um, so that they can have this naloxone readily available in case somebody in the vicinity is overdosing so that we can catch that right away. 
Uh, we are also um, have what's called the, um, uh, the, the Healthy Beverage Zone. Uh, the Healthy Beverage Zone is a network of 40 plus um, uh, partners who come together, work with bodegas, and work with our um, smaller supermarkets. And we do the, you know, they, they do a pretty good job at seeing how is it that we can market uh, not only, not only, not only giving their their um, patients, so the the clinics, the information on health, drinking healthy beverages, doing away with juice, doing away with um, with soda, um, but also going into the the bodegas and seeing how we can market it a little bit different. So I enjoyed watching you get excited talking about the different initiatives you've working, uh, you guys have worked on in terms of food and access and things like that. There is this um, perception from the general public that elected officials don't care about uh, vulnerable communities. So hearing you speak um, in regards to how you think of um, the disabled um, population or even mothers with children who have um, uh, Food, the, the food, yes, food, food allergies. allergies. Yes. yes, yes. I'm allergic to shellfish. Oh, okay. And then we we have so. But I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no. But 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 just the consideration in terms of how you guys go ahead and coordinate, um, putting these policies out and putting these initiatives out. Um, it's refreshing to hear, um, and I'm glad to be a part of dissecting um, these illusions of like uh, elected officials not caring about. Well, yeah. well uh, we appreciate that, and it's not just this office, but we have, um, you know the different delegations of and levels of government here in the Bronx, all the elected officials are working together. It's personal to us. Uh, I'm not going to lie, some of it is competitive as well because we don't want to be, we're tired of being last. I got a sense of that. <laughs> right? just, you know, we, we were, one, once upon a time we were in last place as it related to employment. Or in other words, we were number one in unemployment. And that's no, you know, we take this very seriously. And we just don't want to be number 62 anymore. Uh, and we, you know, we, we work closely together. We, um, um, we find innovative ways and creative ways. So for instance, with all of the development that's going on in, in the Bronx and in the city of New York, you know, a lot of this development, you have to have um, the, an environmental impact study. You have to have traffic studies. So we're saying, look, why not have a health study? You know, what will it mean if you tear down this old building, what, what carcinogens may be in that building that may affect the surrounding community? Why is it that we can't have that study and see how we can remediate that? What does it mean to have this construction and particulate matter in the air, whether it's you know, the, the, the concrete that's being poured in? Uh, how is it that we have that incorporated? So we have legislation that everyone has supported. Um, it's, it hasn't passed yet. Uh, is that correct, John? The legislation? It has not. No. It hasn't had, but, we, but we, we're really pushing the envelope. If we're building, if we're creating jobs, if we're decreasing the, the crime rate, if we're building in, a, in, a economic, in an environmental friendly way with green development, um, if we're bouncing back in, with regard to our image, what are we doing it for if the people who live here you know, are, gonna, are, are dying off. You know, why are we doing it for if the people who live here and our children won't be able to benefit? So, you know, we, we're, we're doing everything that we can in combating obesity, getting into the schools. Uh, we uh, working with, with, with our businesses so they can see that we want them to market um, healthier products and produce uh, and, and, and feature them more prominently in their location. And it's a huge, huge undertaking. Um, but I'm, I'm proud of the efforts that we've made and I'm proud that so many people have, have committed themselves to, to be our partners. So again, we have so many different issues, um, uh, housing, uh, diabetes, uh, mental health, opioid addiction. All of these things are interrelated. And so I think that as we move forward, what we want is for healthcare providers, whether they're clinics or hospitals, uh, to have the, like a primary care behavioral, behavioral health so that if somebody's coming in because, um, you know, their stomach hurts, 
um, and you want to you know you you want to do an analysis as to what's the the cause of that problem. Uh, maybe you can do that, but I think that there should also be a conversation about their living conditions. There should be a, a, a conversation about what kind of development is happening around their immediate neighborhood. And so they, they, we, we, that I think that what we should do as a society is trend towards a, a, a place where when you go to the hospital, is much more, the conversation has to be much more than you, you just talking to your doctor, your primary doctor, about what's ailing you physically, but also being uh, able to, to have a person there to work with, with the patients to, to see what other uh, components of their life may be a contributing factor to poor health. The biggest, most important partners have to be the residents. You can't always put it on government. You can't always put it on your elected officials. You can't even put the onus on your health providers. We really have to do better uh, about eating healthier. Uh, and a lot of it is cultural. Look, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican, and my, my sons who are adult men now, uh, they, never, they grew up slim, but every time I went to my mother's house, or every time we went to my mother-in-law's house, they would basically chastise my wife and I and say, oh, you know, those kids are dying, they're so skinny. No, they, it, you know, it, it's almost like, you know, they want the kids to be obese. And, um, and so I know it's cultural and it's not just Puerto Ricans, but it's, you know, the West Indian community, the spices. We, we just have to do better and, and it's hard because how do you explain to a grandmother in particular, right, in any culture, that she shouldn't scoop an, an additional, you know, a spoon of rice when, the, when her grandkids are done, or that they shouldn't sprinkle a little bit more sugar uh, on that iced tea. Um, and and for the, uh, culturally, it's, it's all, you know, an action of endearment. But what people need to realize is that you're really, really hurting your loved ones. And so we want the community to be involved. It is important. Uh, that you get involved because ultimately uh, the elected officials are going to answer to pressure. And that pressure comes from the voters, that pressure comes from the communities. Uh, every single time that you see uh, a huge movement, whether it's women's suffrage movement, civil rights movement, every time you see uh, uh, the LGBT um, and you know the Stonewall movement uh, to give people equality in the gay and lesbian community. It's, all, it, it's never really come from government. It's always come from the, the people. And when you look now in the city of New York, uh, obviously there's so much that we need to fight for. Uh, we need to make sure that our police officers, that we work with them, that they treat our young men, particularly black and Latino men in particular, um, accordingly and with respect, and we're, we're doing better in that area. We need to make sure that uh, we keep the rents into a place where people can afford it, but we also create jobs and give it to our folks so they can, so they can feel dignified and that they're not getting a handout, but that they're working for it. We need to ensure that we protect our environment. We need to make sure that, uh, you know, we uh, fight for those men and women who live in our public housing, uh, who have been suffering uh, by living in, in, in uh, freezing apartments. Uh, we need to, to make sure that we protect women's rights and allow for them to, um, uh, to have that, that, that equity and equality in the workplace, regardless of the industry. But if you notice all of the issues that I touched on that we still have to fight, health touches all of that. Health is such a huge umbrella. It could be um, those that are addicted to, um, to substance, and abuse substances or opioids, um, that's a health issue. If, if somebody is being bullied in school, um, psychologically, that's a health issue. If you have gun violence, that's a health issue. If you need to provide um, uh, people in the public housing who are exposed, unfortunately, to lead paint, who, are, who don't have the boilers, that's a health issue. When you, when you have a mother who has, to, who has to work two and three jobs because she, um, it, she's not getting paid the same amount of money that a man who's doing the same job that she is, how about her children? And the fact that they don't have a mother home 
nurturing them and cooking the right meals and, and being there for them. Those are myriad of different health issues. And, and so uh, I, I really can't express more on you who are watching to get involved, uh, whether, you know, immigration rights, um, basically just voting. If you can vote, if you can participate in whatever rallies, ultimately, ultimately, um, you know, it, it's affecting our health physically, psychologically, spiritually. And when it's all said and done, no matter who you are, no matter what your title is, no matter what your background is in life, no matter how much money you have, if you don't have good health, what are you doing it all for?